Um, quiet rooms, what you see on the screen there, um, the right-hand plan, is actually an extract from um, uh, a school uh, on which we've been advising uh, as a sort of client design advisor. Um, and I just want to show you that um, the, quiet, the quiet rooms there, which appear in, in that sketch there as well, uh, are multifunctional. They're partly where you can take a child who's having certain problems and maybe having a little bit of a tantrum or displaying challenging behavior. You can take him in there to calm him down, but you can also use it as a, a, a room to take uh, a young person who's maybe having difficulty with their work and needs a one-to-one -one space in which to um, communicate closely with his teacher or whatever. So I do urge that um, anybody here who's involved in schools, and I'm sure you, you're, you're probably aware already, the need for class, uh, quiet rooms is um, very high priority, and they need to be distributed around the school, uh, not just one at one end and one at the other, so that you've got 50 yards to, or 100 yards to walk to get there, because by that time you've got a child on your hands who's out of control, and that's what you don't want. You want to be able to remove them from the, that classroom almost straight away. Uh, colours. This is a tremendously important issue. Um, we have just uh, completed a research study and program with um, the University of Kingston, uh, who actually led the research. Um, Professor Dalk, who likes to be credited on these issue matters quite rightly, um, headed the, um, the research. And it was really to look at colors that work well in an autistic environment. Um, obviously, we avoid challenging colors like orange and red. Uh, we like to go for the more quiet colors. Uh, and also another issue, if you look at the picture bottom left, you'll see that um, the colors there are rather harsh, reflective. It's just what we don't want. Um, it's a very good example of a, of a reflective and hard floor finish there, by the way. So that's a very unfriendly looking space. The picture in the middle uh, refers back to a picture you've probably already seen on an earlier earlier picture, uh, where we've used gray, uh, gray carpet, gray stained ceiling and doors and skirtings and door frames and so on. And that is a quiet, not only quiet acoustically, which I've already talked about, but quiet um, visually. On the top right, you'll see six colors. Now, they're not the only six colors, please don't think that. They are simply six colors that are six of a number, uh, which are deemed to be uh, <coughs> acceptable to people with ASD. Uh, the way the research was, was, was handled was that uh, Professor Dalt came into our office and went through a, a huge number of color samples with us, asked us to give our opinion of what we thought were the preferred colors. Then she did exactly the same exercise with the, with the staff at three different places where we'd worked, uh, where we'd built buildings, and also uh, asked the children which colors they liked, and they had to pick out the ones they, they wanted. And this, the, these six here were, were the sort of, um, uh, top of the top of the choice list, as you might say. Um, and the top and bottom right photograph you see is a typical bedroom in that small residential building I showed you, where I think there are four colors that were chosen from uh, an earlier palette. That was before the research program. And um, <clears throat> one of them was blue, uh, one of them was a greeny color, one of them was a sort of purple, and I can't remember what the fourth one was, probably gray. And the children coming into those rooms were given the choice they could have any one of those colors, and then the room was purposely um, painted uh, to that choice. So that's how we can try to, um, you know, give children a participation in, um, in, in, in the way their room looks. Uh, lighting is probably, well, for me anyhow, is the, probably the most difficult of all the design issues that we have to try and solve. Um, <clears throat> we, we don't like uh, the sort of lights you see in the bottom center picture and the bottom right, those are fluorescent 
uh, lights, and I'm sure everybody knows that um, fluorescent lights flicker and are very disturbing to people with ASD. So whatever happens, at all costs, you must avoid uh, fluorescent tube lighting. Compact fluorescents, however, are acceptable, and beyond that, there's a range of other, other, other lights that work well. Uh, people ring me up sometimes and say, they see on our website, you know, things we've said about lighting in articles we've written, and um, they ring up and ask advice, and I basically say to them, the best thing is to get yourself a good lighting consultant and really <clears throat> make sure that the lights that are chosen are the right sort of lights uh, and give you the right sort of design. The, the top right photograph you see there illustrates uh, indirect lighting being used where you don't necessarily see the uh, light source. You might describe that as a sort of pelmet type lighting. Uh, we've used that as well and that, that is quite successful. But what I would like to say to you is that what we aspire to is to design a building that glows. I hope all the non-English speakers in this room will uh, understand the word glow, but please find out what that means. If you don't know G-L-O-W, it means it sort of, it, it has its sense of light without you necessarily seeing where that source of light is. Very, very difficult to do. I don't think we've yet achieved it, but that's um, what we try to, to get to. Um, the bottom left photograph I haven't mentioned, that's an okay space, I suppose. You can't see any nasty light fittings, but it's a bit big and a bit um, uh, unfriendly, so I don't think that's a really terribly good example, but I think the top right picture does illustrate uh, what I'm trying to say. Uh, heating is another very important issue. Um, if you look at the photograph bottom right, that shows you a traditional two-panel radiator. Good old cheap and cheerful radiator with exposed pipes all over the place. First of all, your children or adults will pull those pipes off the wall or have a damn good go at it. Um, they'll post papers and anything they can, dirty pants, old socks, teddy bears, everything else behind the radiator. And um, the staff will forever be digging them out. And then, of course, if they should fall against the radiator, not only will it be hot and they run the risk of burning themselves, but they might um, carve a lump out of their heads where they hit their heads on the um, spiky corner of the radiator, all very much to be avoided. Uh, what we advocate, um, well, actually, there is one interim solution which people use, and that's what's called a low surface temperature radiator. So you can touch it and you can keep your hand on it and it won't burn you. But because they give out very little heat at a time, uh, you have to have rather a lot of them, and they're rather big and rather bulky and ugly. And so although they work, uh, they're struck out of my list. I don't use them. Uh, I go for, I would prefer underfloor heating, which you see in the bottom right photograph. Well, it's impossible to take a photograph of underfloor heating because you see nothing. Uh, it's under the floor. Uh, quite obviously. So uh, the photograph there shows you the underfloor heating in the course of construction. In other words, the, the pipes under the floor, concrete goes over the top, and then the floor finish, and there's your heating. Um, another solution is ceiling heating. Uh, that's the photograph, uh, both top right and bottom left. It's the same job, actually. And I'm just going to point out to you where the heating is, if you haven't spotted it. That is, that is the um, radiant heating panel there, and going around there. And uh, people ask me, well, you don't, don't, you, don't you get a very hot head? And I say to them, no, not at all. If it's properly designed, it works brilliantly. When you walk on underfloor heating, do you, get under, do you get hot feet? The answer is no, if it's properly designed. So radiant ceiling panels are excellent. Um, we had nothing but good reports about that project, and um, underfloor heating, uh, I think we know, works very well as well. Only one disadvantage with that is that uh, it does have a fairly slow response time, which is not, in, not the case uh, with the um, radiant uh, ceiling panels. Oh, sorry, one, one. sorry, you have a minute. You have a minute, please. One minute, okay. Uh, curtains and blinds, um, we would not have blinds as you see in the right hand picture. Um, they're just hung on the inside, they get damaged as you can see there. We put them in between the double glazing. Uh, it looks 
uh, like the picture in the middle, very neat and tidy, quite expensive because you have to use remote control, but they are very successful and work well. Security, I'm going to skip over fairly quickly. Um, the, um, I, I prefer to use magnetic locks on any doors where there are children on the other side because they get released when the fire alarm is pressed and you don't run the risk of uh, anybody, child or adult, being locked inside uh, in a sudden emergency. Um, door closers, um, those sort on the bottom right don't work because um, you can swing on them, get your fingers caught in the mechanism there. Uh, we go for the type that are recessed in the door with a single arm and you only see the arm when it's... Um, uh, when it's, um, hmm, I don't know why that's jumping. Okay, well. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry, but this is. Not going to the next one. Oh, there it is, rather slow. Can I just go on for one more minute? No? Yeah, okay. Thank okay. you. I'll stop there. <laughs> um, thank you very much.